Geh zur Seite. Was soll's? Ihr Götz von Berlichingen habt euch der Rebellion gegen Kaiser und Reich schuldig gemacht. Ein Strick um deinen Hals. Weiters habt ihr des Reiches Majestät. Vor Gottes Angesicht, schwer und ungerecht beleidigt. Beleidiger der Majestät? Ich? Darum wird nunmehr an euch die Reichsexekution vollzogen. Ihr werdet aufgefordert, euch dem ausgesandten Hauptmann auf Gnade und Ungnade zu ergeben. Nicht ergeben? Auf Gnade und Ungnade? Mit wem redet ihr? Bin ich ein Räuber? Sage deinem Hauptmann, vor ihrer kaiserlichen Majestät habe ich immer schuldigen Respekt. Er aber, sagt sie ihm, er kann mich im Arsch lecken. In the year of 1540, a 60-year-old imperial knight with only one hand receives a letter from the emperor himself, declaring the old man a free man after 12 years of incarceration. He calls him up to help to fight the Turks on their way to the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. After 12 years of unjust incarceration, one would expect this old man to maybe hold resentment, even hate for the system that brought him in this situation. But none of this can be seen. He puts on his iron hand, asks the servant to ready his horse, and instantly rides with joy and excitement to the Emperor's help in this most holy fight. This introduction gives a small insight into the personality and into the life of the Imperial Knight Götz of Berlichingen, who was born in 1480 in South Germany of the HRE. In this video, we will follow Götz through his exciting life and will not only learn what it was meant to be one of the last generations of the German knights in the classic sense, but will also look at the Holy Roman Empire during the 15th century which he was living in. The situation of the Holy Roman Empire at the end of the medieval era is for the average person, even in Germany, a very complicated and largely unknown topic. Even among audiences interested in history, it is often explained dismissively as a decentralized and confused political mess. While this assessment may be true in some ways, the truth is far from incomprehensible. However, this situation, even amongst the Empire's contemporaries, was certainly unique. The available literature that does exist focuses on state policy and territorial changes, rather than the relationship of individuals and smaller groups to the political apparatus. This loses the human element necessary to understand the function of this historical apparatus. The actions of emperors like Maximilian I and Charles V, whose wars are well known, are usually the exception. The stories of knights like Götz, who actually lived in the empire and dealt with its unique qualities on a daily basis, is almost unknown, especially in the international world. Hopefully, this video will change this. Götz von Berlichingen is a perfect example to represent the struggle of late German knighthood. The lower nobility in late medieval times was a shell of its former self. It had been impoverished by declining populations, rising labor costs and radical increases in the cost of financing their lifestyle and duties. The lower nobles were also losing their old bureaucratic positions to the newly developing urban middle class. At the same time, they were faced with political struggles inside the empire, stemming from the reformation, forcing many of them to fight just to hold on to what they have left. Goetz's autobiography shows many aspects of the unique situation of Germany at the time, both good and bad. I will not go over every part of Götz's life, because a video can only be so long. But if this topic in general hooks you, I'm happy to announce my collaboration with Antelope Publishing. I've worked with the great people from there to translate Götz's original diary for the first time into the English language. So if you are interested, you can read up on his life and stories in his own words by the time when this video is out, from their website, and even support me partially by buying it. Götz's life can be generally split in five phases. The wars for Maximilian I, feuds, the peasant war, his incarceration and the Turkish wars. In this video I will mostly go into the wars for Maximilian I and the peasant wars, 
I will obviously mention the feuds and additional historical information so to contextualize everything nicely. But if the feuds, the small anecdotes and the Turkish war is the primary thing that hooks you, the book is probably the way to go. Either way, with all that out of the way, let's start with how Götz entered the world of medieval violence. Götz was born into a lower noble family. The Berlichingens were a Frankish noble family that already existed during the times of Charlemagne and before people even commonly used last names in Germany. This sounds like a rather privileged family to be born into. And if this was the time of Charlemagne or Otto the Great, you might be correct, but this was not the case. We're in the year 1480, where some historiographers already ended the medieval period 30 years before. The lower nobility was not doing well around this time. Three sectors damaged the lower nobility, both uh, economic, social and military-wise. First, the population decline of the 13th century led to the rising wages for the lower nobility while combining it with lower sales of wheat and other farming yields. This combined itself to also an emancipation of the peasantry to a certain extent. With their new value, they had more leverage. At the same time, urbanization exploded, leading to the forming of an urban middle class, or as some historians call it, the first proto-capitalist class. Kings and rulers were therefore not forced to pick only nobles for scribes, secretarial or court positions anymore. They could often find better educated and more capable people among the urban non-noble classes. Meanwhile all this was happening, in the social and economical sphere, military also changed. The days of armies consisting of, when compared to ancient history, few knights on horseback were over. Gewalthaufen are literally translated violent hordes of footmen with pikes, zweihanders and the first black powder pipes changed fundamentally how war was acted out. The cavalry was therefore not the primary for warfare anymore. With the introduction and normalization of cannons, the famous castles and burghs, often owned by even the lowest of nobles, lost all their security advantages, which could only be regained by extremely expensive renovations and adjustments for monetary means, which the lower nobility did not have anymore. So the lower nobility lost large chunks of their income from the slow decline of feudalism, got competition from the new urban middle class, lost their mode of warfare and even their symbols of prestige, their castles, got reduced to trivialities. So therefore Götz picked probably the worst time to be born as a lower noble. At least the loss of the scribal and bureaucratic positions didn't seem to be of much relevance to him because it became clear from an early age that he had no interest in school matters. What he did care about was horse riding and sword fighting. Götz climbed the career ladder, if you want to call it that, through his family rather quickly and got already accustomed to the political structures of the Reich in the year 1495 when he was allowed to visit with his uncle the infamous famous Wormser Reichstag. Ironically, this was the Reichstag where the Ewige Landsfriede was declared, or in English, the Eternal National Peace. This glorious name for a law was a law that banned all feuds across the country an activity Götz will become infamous for participating way later in his life. But how could this be, you ask? How can this activity be banned, but at the same time be the thing that made him so infamous? Well, legality and praxis always look different in the HRE. And for this we have to explain the legal foundation of the time we are in. A Reichstag was a meeting of the, all the estates of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. So all the leaders of German territories, church leaders, council leaders of the cities and everything alike. The HRE went through something we see in many other European nations at the time. Something someone could call nationalization. This can be shown by obvious things like for example the ethics of the German nation being introduced at this time. But also through very real changes in legalisms. The HRE was at its core still a very medieval system. The prime way of solving disputes for low nobles was feuding. A fight that was basically a small scale war against each other. This was now supposed to change. Frederick III and also his successor Maximilian I slowly began something called the monopolization of violence and legalism. All violence inside the HRE was supposed to be legitimized through an emperor and its institutions, which was the Reichstag. 
but the HRE was a bit different. The sole executive power did not come from the Emperor. The fact that the Emperor itself was an electoral monarchy was also part of this, but way more important is how the legal system actually worked. The Emperor was the initiator and ratifier, which on its own made him very powerful. And he was very powerful, opposed to many other historical interpretations. But one thing that was different is that the middle step is missing here. When a Reichstag began, the Emperor declared what topics shall be discussed at this Reichstag and what he intends to solve. But the actual how was not done by him. The Emperor did not debate in the Reichstag. All the practical making of laws was left to the nobles, city leaders and church leaders. He in the end only ratified it. So the Emperor was therefore responsible for the what and why, but not for the how. This created in some ways an extremely productive decentralization of issues. Because just cause a ruler wants something done, doesn't mean that this will always align with reality a lot. The HRE managed therefore that if the Emperor wanted something unrealistic, or something that was so against the interests of one estate, the resulting proposed law was either so bad he didn't ratify it, or the estate whose interests felt threatened simply didn't propose a law at all instead of the other option which would be declaring civil war. With this information you can probably already see how the HRE's system worked. It was a cooperative system between the monarch and the nobility and other estates. Something called Deutsche Libertät or the freedom of the German nobility. They didn't see themselves as servants to the universal holy monarchy but as a core part of the system that they participated in cooperatively. This is how feuds weren't effectively eradicated because the proposed laws, maybe on purpose, lacked the necessary practical means to actually prosecute feuds. All this politics is what young Goetz experienced firsthand on his first journey himself and certainly made him far more intelligent than many other people later assumed of him. And he already at a young age had a very thorough understanding of the role of the emperor and his own nobility. The cousin of Goetz that taught him the basics of being a squire and took him along to the Reichstag died of unknown causes, probably a disease, and young Goetz himself with his cousin knights had to transport his body back to the family for procession. With his cousin's death, any chance for Goetz to join the high nobility started feigning away. And instead of being associated with complicated Reichstag politics, Goetz joined Sir Veit von Lettersheim in his war in Upper Burgundy. Goetz was fit for war already at this young age. Even though he was only a squire, he still, 60 years later in his autobiography, shows how fast of a squire he was and he was faster than anybody else at readying the horses. The Burgundian war is infamous for one thing in the war diaries, the horrible humid heat. Goetz witnessed many brave knights die, not by sword, but by them dying of heat in their armor. During this campaign, Goetz's father passed away, and he therefore returned home and went into service for the great Margrave Friedrich as his honor squire. In the Margrave service is where we can see Goetz's special personality first reveal itself. Goetz sat next to a Polish squire, a well-groomed man who even groomed his hair with eggs. Goetz proud of his dress and armor, wore his harness and when getting up from the table, brushed the Polish boy's pretty hair. The Pole got greatly angered and tried to stab Goetz with his butter knife. Goetz therefore had to defend himself, obviously, but was nice enough to pick his short and not his long rapier and punched him over the head, as to solve the dispute. Goetz continued his day and his duties as a, god, as a good squire would, but then after church service was suddenly apprehended by the men of the Margrave. Goetz shouted, inconceivable, leave me untouched, I have to go up to the young princess. The man let go. Goetz said himself that he would have not liked to harm this man, for he was only doing his duty. But if he wouldn't have let him go, he probably would have gotten himself into even more trouble. He ran up the tower, speak with the queen, but only to find the two young princes who tried to speak to their father, but to no avail. He was to be thrown into jail. Goetz shouted and shouted, how it was only self-defense, but nobody that listens. They threw the young man into jail and after 15 minutes released him. In the court, all his 60 squire friends stood around him defending him and in the end, Goetz got off free. 
This story will not be the last time Guts will break with the law, but this is of course known, but it is the first time his personality got the best of him. His life path continued as one would expect of a young noble around this time. With 17, Goetz practiced in the ruthless Swiss wars under Margaret Friedrich, under the general command of the emperor himself. The Kaiser even spoke to him shortly. Sadly, the Swiss wars did not go in the empire's favor. The nobility refused to attack early, the Swiss had time to reinforce their defenses, and the emperor's idea of an early attack was disputed by the nobility. This war was Goetz's first contact with war and true violence. When Goetz arrived in a place named Tangen, some Swiss occupied a church and shot down from the tower, and said they would rather die than break their oath. Goetz's horse got shot and many of his comrades were not so lucky and got killed. His gunsmith, a brave little man, as he called him, stood next to him, was shot and the round went through his little man's body and killed another man, but the gunsmith survived. Goetz, now without a horse, ran towards the church and grabbed a random spear, cause his rapier was still on his horse. A comrade brought gunpowder and lit it under the church tower and the Swiss man burned alive. One soldier fell from the tower with a child in his arms. The soldier died, the child survived. Some knights of Goetz's side spent too much time looting the church and perished themselves. No man who entered the church besides the child left the church alive. Goetz did not do any man-to-man -man fighting in this instance, but this was his first contact with war as an actual knight in a war. The Swiss war, all in all, ended with a defeat for the Imperial Army. Goetz fought in many further wars. The Bavarian War in 1504 was the most fierce. But this video can of course not describe every single fight and event. That's what the book is for after all. The Bavarian War was typical for the time. Cannon wagons, bunch of men with spears hurled up trying to use forests as a vague form of cover for the advances and so on. Goetz, the man he was, while being bombarded from all sides, managed to hold out in one skirmish, pushing up to the cannon wagons alone and then destroying them, something one would deem almost suicidal. He then even survived long enough of his men until reinforcements arrived. Luck, you would assume, was truly on his side. Goetz's young luck lasted all the way till next Sunday, where he got his arm blown off. Goetz was on his horse. A cannon hit his arm and destroyed his sword in such a specific way that the parts flew into his arm. Not much of the sword was left. Half the sword was shot off, the other cut into his arm until his braces. The sword was so deep one could not see it anymore. Saved by an old Landsknecht, he got healed up in misery and almost fell into a pit of depression. What was a young warrior like him supposed to do without a hand after all? He prayed to God for any advice, till he remembered of another old warrior he knew, who got a metal arm that made him fight like any knight could and this led to him not giving up hope and even contacted the other man with the iron hand named Köchli and started accompanying his sons. His prayers and not giving up helped because for almost 60 years in feud, war and troubles, Götz always came out of them largely unharmed. One might even say all his bad luck was stored in his right hand and was blown away with it. Götz became a war-hardened man. But this was seen as a knightly duty and therefore did not yield much pay. In Götz's own statements, him and his brothers still lived in borderline poverty during this time. For him, this did not matter though. For the praise of the men of higher rank meant way more to him than any gold could. This brings up a very valid question though. How did this great and honorable knight fall into the world of feud and quote unquote crime? Before we get into that, we have to explain what feud even is. Feud, or in German Fede, can be traced back as one of the oldest Germanic traditions. The nowadays controversial definition from Otto Brunner describes feud as a necessary tool of legitimate use of violence if attempts at peace and consultations of a third neutral party failed. The moral and legal limits of a feud were in constant change during the medieval era and were basically constantly adorned in the eyes of the rulers. With the era of the Reichsreform in the early 16th century, 
Fede was officially banned in 1495, like earlier mentioned. If you haven't noticed, this is 13 years before Götz's feud even begun. As earlier, the Kaiser was rarely the executive power of the Reich, but only the leader who proposed or ratified laws. The executive power was the territorial leaders of the empire. Therefore it was up to many dukes to actually follow it up. The problem was that unless one was extremely strong in being a territorial leader, for example the electors of Saxony, Brandenburg or Austria, the nobility had a large sway still over the court, even with its swindling power. Feuds were therefore not persecuted and even further encouraged. It was often understood as a necessary layer of the eternal conflict between legality and praxis. How feud actually functioned was rather simple. The person who felt wrong wrote a feder letter or feud letter in where he describes what he felt has been wronged, what he demands, what he will do and this has to be read by the opponent. One could ask that someone would just avoid reading it but in that case it was publicly declared or hung up on a wall. When a feud was supposed to be over, the party signed an Urfede, in which the treaties like payments, surrendering terms and all that other stuff are worked out. The first feud Götz got dragged into is his infamous conflict with Cologne. Back then this was not the horrid city we know today, but an archbishopry with electoral powers and its own earthly territories. Hans Sindelfingen, a tailor by trade and an excellent marksman, won a shooting competition in the city. The people from Cologne cheated on him though out of his honorable prize and after his attempts to sue through the noble court and even with assistance from other nobles like Reinhard of Saxony, the prize was not given to him. So after legality and a third neutral party failed, Götz offered the man his help and feud was officially declared. Götz's strategy to fight this feud was by capturing merchants on their way to the city, taking them hostage and then ransoming money. It is mentioned how he avoids the roads and regions of graphs he honors, which already shows an even deeper insight into the integrities of the HRE. The graph he met up with advised him easily to not attack and escalate his feud and therefore the feud was almost boringly settled by a grave setting up a meeting with Cologne. With his first feud ending rather boringly we can take a look at how his biggest feud came to be. The feud with Nuremberg was started for two reasons. First because a childhood friend of Götz, Fritz von Litwach, a Margravian servant suddenly disappeared. He was kidnapped and taken prisoner, all without demands for ransom money or even informing his family, which was usually the norm in nobility disputes. It came out that it was the Nuremberians who did this dishonorable act. And therefore Götz was asked by his relatives to get the Urfede of their enemies. The second reason was that Götz had a squire named Georg von Geislingen. The Nuremberians harmed this young squire so much that he passed away from his wounds. These two reasons were way more than needed for a passionate feud between these parties. Götz justifies himself here as the bringer of justice. In his own words, only the poor and loyal and charitable Götz von Berlichingen took on both of these injustices. The feud became insanely costly for Götz. The Empire declared Acht and Aberacht. But even with this, Götz captured so much money from Nuremberg that the Kaiser himself repeatedly encouraged a settlement to be finally achieved. He lost almost 200,000 gulden in this, paid men in armor and swore to beat every single Nuremberian. But the advice of his friends told him to seek a settlement through the Kaiser himself. Götz's plundering was so bad that merchants ran to the Kaiser and begged him to intervene, saying they could never recover their losses. The Kaiser in response said, Dear God, Holy God, what is this? One of them only has one hand, the other only one leg. What would you merchants do if they had both hands and both legs? If a merchant loses a bag of pepper, the entire Reich should be alarmed and send troops, but when imperial royalty is in need of trade, then concerns lords, dukes, other kingdoms and the entire Reich, then the merchants are nowhere to be found. Götze's deep appreciation of the Kaiser was only strengthened through this, and he insists that he never in his life acted against the House of Austria, even if he, in his own opinion at least, could have easily done so. There are many feuds of Götz that can hardly be described in one video. And if you want every single one and every anecdote, the book is there for you. And while the feuds are what made Götz infamous, 
an even bigger event with even longer lasting consequences was his role in the peasant war. The root of the peasant uprisings in 1525 are till this day still wildly argued by historians and is, when you go below the surface layer, a highly political discussion. Some claim that the uprisings in 1525 were a continuation from the minor ones already in the 1510s. Some disagreeing, saying it was a new event. Some are disagreeing with the term in general and instead of the peasant war, suggest the term the time of the peasant revolt. If you believe the common conception that we are in a time where peasants were brutally oppressed, that they had no choice but to revolt, you would be wrong. The peasants obviously did face harsh conditions. The developments of early capitalism infected every class and also the peasantry. This combined with the classic inheritance system with land being redistributed to all sons, therefore land becoming smaller and smaller over generations, forcing more and more loans and suddenly being significantly indebted to the urban upper classes, the nobles and landowners were at the same time going through similar issues I described earlier, therefore putting more restrictions on serfs through hunting and poaching restrictions. On the other hand, with the slowly recovering population levels and the previous rise in the value of labor, serfs were already in a better position than they were just a couple of decades ago. Peter Blickle, one of the most important German historians on the topic, described the peasant uprisings not as a forced revolt out of a starving necessity, but a motion grown out of a position of improvement that allowed further actions that were previously impossible. When also reminded that the peasantry was universally armed across the land, footmen becoming more and more important, this situation was a very sensitive balance of power in the German rural world, that the reformation only needed to blow up. The reformation in itself was not the sole goal of the peasants, but it did lend them rhetoric that they appropriated and could use effectively to justify their causes. It is important to understand that the peasant revolts were not led by the classic stereotype of the noble serf fighting for his liberation from tyranny, but by often urban middle class men. The fact that most of the leaders of the peasant bunches knew very well how to read and write is only a small example of this. The famous 12 demands written by the peasants show the typical stuff. Abolishment of financial restraints put on them by the urban capitalist class, discussing new terms for taxation from the nobles, being allowed to choose their priests, church services in German, courts should be orientated around Christian love, and so on and so on. The interesting part is that they were ready to drop any of these 12 claims if one of their claims was proven to be contradictory to what was written in the Bible. The inspiration for this obviously coming from Luther's Sola Scriptura. Luther himself was always critical of the peasants. At the beginning slightly, when the peasants radicalized, he openly called for them to be put down. The lower nobility, which was rather pro-reformation therefore, saw no theological contradiction and the peasants were put down by both Catholic nobles and Lutheran nobles. The whole drama ended with around 70,000 dead parents, peasants, so it was quite a bad situation for South Germany. So why am I explaining all of this? because it's important to understand how Götz fell into this. With the whole peasantry being armed and communication back then still being rather slow, many lower nobles did not have the means or time to really prepare for the revolts that were about to happen and same can be said for Götz. That Götz was not the same as for example the famous Florian Gaia who voluntarily sided with the peasants does not need much explanation. Götz instantly sent a letter to his higher ups and family to gather support against the peasants but the woman of his house hid the responses he got because they feared it was already too late to side against the peasants. And doing so at this stage would lead to certain doom. The peasants therefore had Götz's home surrounded and the Gundelsheimer peasant bunch invited him for discussions. But what is there to discuss with a noble such as Götz you might ask? Well, while it is true that the nobles lost status in both bureaucracy and economy, one thing they were still pretty much solely in control over were military matters. A peasant revolt could have had all the arms and people in the world and well-educated salesmen, smiths or tax scribes, but one thing it lacked was military organization. Matters of supplies or how to organize the siege. The peasants therefore required nobles on their side. Goetz was invited by the peasants and under the fear of seeing his entire family being hurt or worse, 
accepted. In an inn near Gundelsheim, he met another noble who encouraged Götz to take the role as captain of the peasants. Götz's own words describe his feelings better than I could ever myself. God be with me. The devil would have to force me himself. Why don't you do it instead? His noble friend motivated him to at least attempt discussions of the peasants. The massacres that the peasants committed against nobles, like for example in Weinsberg, were still very much present in Goetz's mind. The reason was simple. Under the leadership of Goetz, Goetz could do harm reduction, therefore he volunteered to enter the peasants' camp. He was treated most respectfully when he first entered and the discussions began. Even with all this, Goetz still could not accept the title of captain of the peasants. It was too contradictory to his own morality. Their behavior and mind were as far apart as the heaven and earth, he said. He loudly proclaimed that he would be rather beaten to death like a sick dog than lead a peasant bunch that did massacres like in Weinsberg. The peasants made Goetz a good offer. He only has to lead them for four weeks and they will contractually swear that violence like in Weinsberg shall never happen again. Every peasant had to write a letter to their families, principality or whatever that they shall harm no house that was owned by a noble. With all this being agreed upon, Goetz took the role of the captain of the peasants for an agreed upon period of four weeks. Problems started to arise quickly. On the march from Ammerbach to Miltenberg, the peasants suddenly set up positions without any orders of Goetz for them to be doing so. When Goetz looked for the reason, he found out that a letter was read out to the peasants which stated that Graf Georg of Wertheim, a noble of the area, not only rejected the peasant demands, but even demanded worse conditions of the peasants than before the revolts. The infuriated peasants ignored orders and swore to beat every noble to death who would agree with such a contract. Goetz instantly planned to ride out to the peasants, but was stopped by a more honorable peasant who begged him not to ride out to the peasants. For out of anger against nobility, they might even kill Goetz himself. Goetz's hated personality obviously rejected this friendly advice, and when he returned to the peasants, he saw Willenberg burn. This clear contractual break by the peasants did not give Goetz an easy way out. So he began to lead the peasants for his remaining days in such a horrendous way that they would be happy to get rid of him. While this plan maybe sounded great in his head, another friendly peasant came up to him and informed him that while he was not a hypocrite for intentionally acting out his captain role badly, he has to stop acting in such a way because if he shall continue, the peasants agreed upon to cut off his head. Goetz, with his understanding of having no way of escape, even if God came down on earth himself, he simply acted out his role as he was supposed to, as to not be called an oathbreaker. The defeat of the peasant began slowly when the Swabian League marched against them. Goetz, even though he was a firm enemy of the Swabian League during his feuds, praised them and used this as a chance to escape. His story and decision-making process remains a constant through his entire biography. His own words describe his justification better than I could ever rewrite. I did nothing other than to prevent any further damage to the princes, the lords, the church, and in short, to everyone of both higher and lower standing, as well as I could. I risked my life for this in every second I was with them, during which I could never be sure if they would not cut off my head. Nobody can accuse me of even stealing or desiring any valuables, because I tried to prevent any looting as well as I could. I never participated in any war where I prayed more often to God for a quick peace and for my honor to not be destroyed than in this peasant war. The fact that for other nobles this entire ordeal seemed more than suspicious is obvious. He made enough enemies during his times of feuding that all these people came out and made propaganda against him. He supposedly was a loyal supporter of the peasants, robbed nobles and burned down castles with joy. On the other hand, Goetz, because of his loyalty and personality, had very close friends in high places. He was invited for breakfast with Graf Georg Tursess. The Graf asked Goetz if he truly planned to surrender himself to the court and the Swabian League. Goetz's response and actions showed the genuineness of his motivations. He responded to the Graf, who offered him even plans of escape, and told him that he will surrender himself even if the chance to get arrested in the tower is absolute. 
for the shame of being seen as a criminal and guilty from running away was worse than the worst jail time. Goetz was aware that he could not face a fair trial, but still volunteered to surrender himself. The court began seemingly fair. He was given a neutral scribe by the Swabian League. Quickly, this changed, though. The League mischaracterized Goetz's action, describing him as a dishonorable villain. With tears in his eyes and fuming in anger, he shouted that he would surrender himself to the Bishop of Mainz in Würzburg to stand before the court and not run away. He will defend his honor like a noble should. All his friends and acquaintances recommended Goetz to pay bribes, monetary sums of apologies, and all other things that would have softened his punishment. But because he saw himself as innocent, he did not even think of doing so. The judges were not the most ideal of target groups Goetz could have received. Most of them were Catholic, while Goetz had already joined the Reformation. Only one noble was part of the court who he knew, and he had feuds in the past with multiple of the judges, and even held one of them as a hostage once. Surprisingly, opposed to what we see later and before the Thirty Years' War, Goetz still believed in the institution itself and believed the judges would do their job honorably, even with their disagreements. He respected their judgment and said they acted honorably and wishes them the best. Maybe he just writes this to sound more pleasant in his biography, but this could be said about everything in this video. This was also the period where he wrote the book about his life that this video is based on. After 10 years of being restricted to his residence, he was freed by Charles V for one last adventure against the Ottomans in 1542 and for the invasion of France in 1544. After the French campaign, he lived peacefully in his castle in Hornberg and died at the age of 82. While Goetz maybe didn't pick the best time to be born as a German lower noble, he certainly picked the best time to pass away in 1562. With the feud slowly disappearing across the Reich, and the last real feud happening in 1567, the noble autonomy declined. Thank God the Reichsreform existed, which offered the nobility courts and other institutions to now manage their conflicts peacefully, instead of the, while limited in scale, armed conflicts. Wouldn't it be horrible if a religious conflict would split the entire higher classes and destroy any trust in exactly those institutions that were supposed to replace feuding? Well, the Reformation accomplished specifically that. The religious divide among the nobility caused a drastic decline in belief in those institutions. While we can still see Goetz believing in the courts that judged him, shortly after his death this already stopped being the case. The religious peace of 1555, five years before Goetz's death, was maybe the last high point of the German nobility. A generation of peace after a decade of religious fighting. Twenty years after Goetz's death, a descendant of a friend of his, Gebhard of Truchsess, began the Cologne War over his right of remaining the Bishop of Cologne, even as a Protestant. The issue was this time not solved legally, but militarily, but without the limiting nature of feuding, and with horrible acts from both sides. The Protestants began to seek allies in Scandinavia, the Calvinists seek allies in the Netherlands, and the Catholics looked towards Spain and Italy. All discourse inside the Reich died, and discourse only existed outside of it. The end of the grand liberty given to knights, nobles and electors for feuding was replaced with legalism that after only 70 years was not trusted by anyone anymore. The time of a united empire with loyal knights proud of their German liberty, ready to cooperate with the emperor for the nation and empire was gone. What was left were local rulers asking for mercenaries and military leaders for profit for territorial ambitions. Something Germany did not recover from up until 1871. As always, thanks for watching. If you want to read Goetz's own words and support me at the same time, you can buy his own autobiography in English, available on Antelope Hill's website. Link in description. See you in the next video, and let's hope that one has a more positive ending.